Okay, firstly, you need to create a three inch grid on your paper. The easiest way to do this is just simply to mark every three inches around every edge of your paper, all the edges. So I'm gonna start up on the top here. And on the short side, there should only be one mark because your paper is six inches long. So I'm counting three inches, making a mark. And then on my long side, I should have to make two marks. If you're starting on the zero, you'll make your marks at three and six. There's three. And there is six. So I'm going to do that on the other two edges of my paper. Okay, and now that I have all of my three inch marks, I'm going to match up the marks that are on the opposing edges. Connect the dots with a straight line. And once you've connected those three pairs of dots, two on the long end, one on the short end, your grid should be complete. So now I'm going to give you the option of what to do if you maybe don't have access to a ruler. So if you have already created your grid using a ruler, you can skip this next part. On your slides, you'll find a place to download a grid. Go ahead and download that. And I'm going to show you how it's very tricky and sensitive to actually, I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here because you all figured this out over the past couple modules, but it's very tricky um, to zoom the Chromebook in just right enough to get it to stop on the edges of your paper. And if you watch my hand on the mouse pad, I am barely rolling the tips of my fingers over the mouse pad, like just back and forth to get it to stop perfectly on the edges of my paper. So once I do that, before I even try to trace the entire line, I'm just going to match up the edges and again, on the short ends, mark where that halfway point is using the grid line. And then I'm gonna shift my paper down so it's even, with the um the square there so i had my bottom edge of the paper on a square on the bottom edge of a square and then i flipped it over and i'm marking the sides of my paper so that way i get the same little dots to connect that i got using the ruler technique so assuming again that you're doing this without a ruler um, you just need to search for something that has a straight edge at your house. Another piece of paper works just fine. And you can use that straight edge then as your makeshift ruler to connect those dots that you just made on your computer. So I'm just going to use the edge of my paper, connect the two dots, and lightly, carefully draw a line on the edge of the paper because it is not the same as a plastic ruler. All right, so next you need to select a person that you want to use as your subject for this portrait project. Let's choose someone who inspires you, someone who you kind of look up to. Um, I decided to use Octavia Spencer, who is one of my absolute favorite actresses um, for my muse for this project. I think she has awesome features to work with. Um, and I just, I'm blown away by her work. Um, so I went ahead and downloaded a picture that I found of her on the internet. So I'm getting logged in here to Canva using my Google account. And once we get through all of this sign in goodness, I'm going to create a new design. We're going to put in the custom dimensions. They're going to be opposite of what we used in the past, still in inches. But I'm going to put in the six first and then the nine. Because since this is a portrait, we want our paper to be oriented like a portrait. 
So here's my blank canvas. And just like we've done for our previous projects, I need to upload the photo that I just downloaded from the internet. So I'm going to go to device and it's not going to show it here on the screencast by video, but it will pull up my recent photos and I will select the one that I just got of Octavia Spencer here. And that is now in my uploads. So you'll notice if you drag your pictures over, they tend to sometimes snap to the background. Um, if you do this and double click, you can move the picture around. I find that kind of annoying to deal with. So what I like to try to do is either drag it over slowly, or you can even just click on it in the uploads um, and it'll put it there in the center and then you can manually drag it around. But we want to try to fill up as much of that six by nine space as possible with our subject's face. And so I'm going to drag this down, center it. I think that looks pretty good. Now I already chose a photo that's black and white. Um, I would highly recommend that if your photo is not black and white to go into the settings, um, I'm sorry, into the filters and change it so it's black and white and then it has some contrast, you know, find those dark darks and light lights that will make your project a lot more interesting. Okay, so next I need to upload my three inch grid. Um, so Screencastify is not going to show you here, but I'm clicking on the device and finding the grid that I downloaded and now it's showing in my uploads here. And just like with my photo, if I drag it over, it's going to want to fill the frame and it'll look like it has a white background. We don't want that. Um, so you can just simply click on it again in the uploads and then manually move it around, position it in a corner and then drag the opposite corner so that way it fills the screen. You want to make sure it doesn't go off of the edges, but that it just perfectly fills your six by nine space there. And then once I have my grid laying on top of my photo, I'm going to go ahead and download my picture. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and pull up the downloaded picture that I just made on Canva. I have it up on my computer screen. I have my gridded out paper. And now I'm going to go ahead and draw the contour line drawings of my muse here, Octavia Spencer. And what I'm doing really requires not so much like artistic talent, but really just an observant eye. Um, a lot of times people who are good at math and have really good analytical skills are good at this sort of grid transfer drawing. But this is something that I'd really like all of you to practice. I am just following a line and seeing basically where it intersects on one of the grid lines and following it until it intersects another grid line. And I am simply looking at lines that follow the edges of values. So I'm looking for lines that outline really dark shadows. Um, so for instance, like the edge of her chin, the edge of the shadow on her chin, the dark shadow between her two lips, the dark shadow on the left side of her nose. Um, and I'm not drawing every single hair because I'm going to eventually go over this with some color. So once I have my contour line drawings done, I'm going to add in some more lines. These are going to be abstracted lines, sort of informed by, um, you can kind of think about like what the muscle structure looks like, but we're going to be inspired by Toyin Oji Odutua's, um, the, the shapes that she uses in her portraiture. And her shapes are sort of like a topographical map. So she sort of starts on the, like the height of the features of the face, like the nose and the cheekbones, and then um, outlines shapes around those. 
So you can have a lot of fun with this. I don't want you to feel a lot of pressure of how things should look. I just want you to pull some inspiration from this. And like I said, have fun. The last time I did this project with some students, they had a really hard time um, feeling like they were messing up their portrait. And the ones who got past that feeling and just sort of like embraced the fact that they were doing something different, they were the ones who had fun with it. They were the ones who came up with something that looked really interesting and creative in the end. So just try to let go and, you know, enjoy the, the process here. Okay, so I went ahead and created all of my shapes. I have a minute, um, a sort of medium amount of shapes. You don't want to get too detailed. You want to make sure um, that you can actually see the shapes. I'm erasing my grid lines right now before I start with the paint. But cleaning up your picture is going to be a really important part before we move on to the paint here. Um, so there's not really a right way or a wrong way to do all of those value shapes on the face. You are just breaking up the space and making it almost like an interesting stained glass topographical map composition. All right, so once I get this kind of touched up and I'm lightening up some of those really dark lines so that way it doesn't messy up my watercolor, then we're going to be ready to move on. Okay, so you have your portrait that is broken down into some value shapes. And now we're going to color everything in using warm colors. We're only going to be using red, orange, and yellow watercolors. Now, you'll notice that red is already darker than orange, and orange is a bit darker than yellow. So use those as values in your portrait. You're used to shading with gray. Think about shading using only your warm color palette. So as I'm looking at Octavia Spencer's portrait in front of me, I'm using it as a reference um, as I'm painting this whole image. Um, I am going over the darkest shadows that you can see here with the red because the red is the darkest color that I have that I'm working with. And so then when I get to the medium grays, I will switch to orange. And when I get to the brightest highlights, I will be using yellow. So I'm using a wet on dry technique. I am moving pretty quickly. Um, and even though my paintbrush is flowing over multiple sections of shapes, um, I'm trying to be a bit conscientious of value. So rather than having it all be the same shade of red, I'm trying to be mindful of using um, a little less water. So that way I have some darker reds, like in this dark shadow up here at the top of the head. I'm also being mindful of areas that need to be left white. Um, for instance, her earrings there are bright and shiny and white in the picture, so I'm going to be careful to paint around them so I can try to leave them white in the end. So her hair is largely um, kind of the same value, so it's fine that I'm painting it all completely red, but I really want to make sure that I'm changing it up as I get into her facial features. So I have these dark shadows still around her chin and in her neck, and then her eyebrows are really dark. She has some dark lines around her eyes. So since those areas are dark, they get treated red. But I'm gonna switch over to the orange for some of these middle gray areas. And to help distinguish some of those shapes that I drew with my pencil, that's where I'm going to maybe even blend a little like orange and yellow together. So that way it's not all exactly the same flat hue. But I want to um, make sure that it, it is a an interesting composition to look at as I go along. Honestly, when I'm doing this part, I kind of 
distract myself from the fact that I'm actually painting a face. I focus a lot more just on the shapes that I'm filling in. And that helps me to not feel so much like, oh, I'm ruining the face. You kind of just have to let it go. Enjoy the process. Enjoy painting. Enjoy watching the colors fill in those shapes. Don't worry about the fact that it is a face. Because some of you will think, oh my gosh, this person looks like a clown now. But it's okay. Just let it go. We are making abstract portraits. This is a process. And if you just keep following along with me, you're going to end up with something really, truly interesting in the end that's going to help you to connect with this person that you are painting. Okay, so the last thing we're going to do to abstractify our portraits and make them even more like um, Odutula's portraits, we are going to add the complements to our warm colors using cool colored pencils. So here I'm just using a blue, a green, a violet. I'm also going to keep my black and my white colored pencil handy to help me with some um, some needed pushes when it comes to value. All right, so I've got those colored pencils ready to go. I want to make sure I have a color pencil sharpener handy as well. Here you can see what colors you're going to use on top of which watercolor. And I want to make this point really clear because this is where the complementary part of our project comes in. By using the green on top of the red paint, the blue pencil on top of the orange paint, the violet pencil on top of the yellow paint, we will be neutralizing those colors so that way your eye does a fun thing called optical color mixing. So your eye will actually help to blend those colors together. And I know it might seem weird to like blend green and red and blue and orange and violet and yellow, but if you've ever played a video game where you get to make your own character, um, that's a great example of how you can use sliders to incorporate those tones into people's skin. Your skin reflects a certain amount of all of those colors. Um, so by altering the, the amount of those complements, that is what gives us our unique skin tone. So we're going to be playing around those complementary sets to create um, sort of an abstract illusion of those neutral tones. All right, it can be kind of daunting to go ahead and start this process because, I don't know, you're probably looking at your portrait at this point, and quite frankly, if you're having an aesthetic reaction to it and you're thinking, dang, I really like the way this looks, stop and take a picture of it. So that way, you have a record of how it looks at this stage. Um, but what I'm going to do is reference my photo once again because values are going to become important. Just as my watercolor has value, so does my colored pencil. And it does matter, I can control how dark my colored pencil is, not just by which one I'm using, but by how hard I press. In general, green, blue, and violet all tend to be kind of dark. So it really is just going to be a game of pushing and pulling and constantly looking at this photo back and forth and back and forth to help create that 3D illusion. And I'm not really going to be coloring with my, um, with my colors either. I'm going to be creating this texture. I love this GIF or GIF or whatever you want to call it um, that shows you the immense layering that Toyino Giyotula does on her artwork. We're going to do that to some extent, not quite to what she does with her ballpoint pens, um, but we're going to add in texture. So I just kind of started winging it. I just started to go in some of the corners and I used a hatching technique, but I used a hatching technique that followed the contours of the shapes that I had 
already started. If this process seems daunting to you, I'm going to pause here and show you some suggestions. All right, so here are three basic texturizing techniques you can use that look somewhat like what Toyinoji Otutuo uses in her own work. So this top section here, I'll get a little bit closer. Okay, this is what I call corner hatching. I call it corner hatching because you're using that parallel line technique of hatching, but you're starting from the corners. So this cluster of shapes that I had here, I just used green on red. I started in the corners and I just sort of spread the fibers out as I dragged my pencil along. Okay, this technique I call sinew strands. Sinew is sort of like the, the texture of muscles. So I started with this blank shape and you can see how I divided each shape into smaller strands of sinew. You'll also notice that repeated pattern of hatching along the sinew strands that really helps to um, create that illusion of like highlights and shadows along that texture. Okay, the last texture method is what I call concentric shapes. You're basically going to take one of your shapes, isolate it, and copy that shape over and over again inside of itself. So it'll end up with something like this. So back to our portrait progress, you are just going to use those methods, and you can use some of them, all of them, one of them, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, you'll kind of get into a groove, but like I said, you just really want to focus on the values. I'm constantly looking at my reference photo as I'm doing this, and I'm looking mostly at what area should be darker and lighter. I'm also really cautious when I go to take my purple pencil on top of the yellow areas because the yellow areas in general are supposed to stay light and the purple is really dark. So I want to be careful not to press too hard with all of my purple lines on top of my yellow areas. But hopefully you will find as I did in this process that it's really fun doing those repeated textures over and over again. Again, you just kind of get lost in the fact that you're not just creating a face, um, but you're kind of having that whole process of what Tween Odutawa um, explains in her interview about how it's like traveling over the landscape of someone's face. And it's a great way of studying and connecting with that person who you find to be so inspiring. Um, so this is probably the lengthiest part. Um, I would make sure that you have a pencil sharpener handy because as your pencil dulls, it will make your textures a lot less defined. So I found myself sharpening my pencil quite a bit and going back over areas that I thought were finished quite frequently. Um, what I often do when I'm making a project like this is rather than really focusing on the areas, I kind of squint my eyes and look at the entire picture. When you squint, it kind of helps you to blur the image and really just focus on value. So if I squint at my picture and then squint at the reference photo, I compare what is dark, what is light, what needs to be darker, what needs to stand out more. Um, in this process, it's a lot easier to make things darker than it is to make things lighter. So be careful about being too heavy handed from the get go. It, like I said, it's always easier to apply more colored pencil to make things darker. And voila, I am pleased with this. So the last thing is that you receive five points for doing something creative with your artwork. So I want to leave the background area for you to express that creativity. I'm not going to prescribe anything for you to do if you wish to paint it, if you want to color it. That is entirely up to you. So I hope you um, relax and give yourself a little bit of grace on this project and just um, enjoy the experience. Can't wait to see what you make.